Thank you, Anita. That was an incredibly kind introduction and far more than I deserve. I think uh, the way Evan introduced me earlier unintentionally was probably better. Like, this is the boring part, so I'm the boring guy. Sorry to, to break the news to you. Um, but I am grateful uh, for you. Uh, it was about a year ago that I was here last, and that was kind of in the peak of, uh, for us, the season when we were realizing, wow, this is really hard <laughs> for life on campus. Uh, and at that time, I asked you to pray with us for our campus, um, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on our campus, for Christians to be shaped into Christ's character, uh, and for Christians to be empowered for God's ministry and mission on our campus. And I want to tell you, we experienced and are grateful for your prayers, uh, because even through that very difficult season that we walked through with students on campus, we saw God do amazing things. Um, and we are experiencing some of the blessing of that difficult season. We actually, in our whole kind of teaching series, um, we went through uh, the desert journey of Israel because it felt like we had just been heaved out into the desert ourselves trying to figure out how to survive on manna. Um, and uh, so we did that in our series, and uh, one of the things that happened as we got into this year, uh, the very th first thing we did, we did a kickoff, which is a tradition for us that we didn't do the year before. We did our kickoff, cookout, carnival, and worship night. On the very first day of classes, we want students to experience the very first thing um, that you do as a student at Grand Valley is worship Jesus and find community among his people. And we were able to do that again this year, and there were about 600 students that were a part of that. And it was a beautiful night and lots of new faces, and it was actually uh, Rich. Are you in here, Rich, right now? There you are, buddy. Rich leans over, who was an incredible gift to us. Thank you for your partnership that allows Rich to participate in ministry on campus. And he reaches over and says to me, and it feels like we just got out of exile. I was like, yeah, that is what it feels like. It feels like we had kind of come home again. Uh, and so we're really grateful for that. And they're seeing God uh, do that life-transforming work in students' lives as they're getting connected to community, getting connected to Christ, and God willing, getting connected to this church. And thank you for your consistent um, activity and outreach to welcome students, new students, into this body uh, of believers, because we love what you're doing here at Alive, and we love that students can be a part of what God's doing on campus and a part of what God's doing in the church here. Uh, and so grateful for your ongoing partnership. I say all of these really good things. I do want to name that there were some challenges uh, this past year, as you know. Um, you're probably aware that the perception of Christians in our society is not at, its, as, at a great point uh, at this particular moment in time. In fact, um, last year, not only were we going through the pandemic, but we had, do you remember around this time we were talking about an election? Does anybody remember that? Yeah, that was kind of a thing that was going on on campus. And in the midst of that, there was also this deep exposure of, of racial tension in our society. So it was really fun last year. Um, but even into this year, we have be continued to um, have to reckon with the reality that the perception of Christians in our society, in our context, is not great. In fact, um, there is a, a popular commentator, a social commentator, who has put it this way. He said, the Biggest hypocrites in America are the Christians. That's fun. And a Barner a research study that was done actually quite a few years ago, even before all of the election uh, drama, which had only exacerbated this, uh, their findings were that the three words that best describe Christians in American society are as follows, homophobic, judgmental, and hypocritical. Who wants that button to wear on their shirt? Huh? I mean, we could argue all day about the, the data and whether or not the perception is fair and all, and all those kind of things, but nonetheless, the uh, unfortunate reality is that the perception is there, and that seems to never have been true for Jesus and the apostles. They were accused of a great many things, um, but not of being mean and hypocritical. In fact, when Jesus, uh, just before the text we're going to read today, which is Luke chapter 6, Jesus says, woe to you if everyone speaks well of you. Right? So it's not about people liking Christ or his church, but, but a question of are we, how do we be more true to who we are and to whose we are. 
So as we enter into the text today, I want to name that as Jesus is uh, preaching this and teaching this, he is doing it to his disciples in the context of a great deal of controversy and a great deal of tension. And his disciples uh, are gathering around him and he's going to name for them something significant about their core identity as children of God and about their core calling as children of God. People who are called to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love their neighbors as themselves. And so Jesus has something to say to us as disciples today about living into our identity and into our calling. And that's what we're going to look at in Luke chapter 6. We're going to start at verse 27. Is that posted up here or not? I didn't send it in, so if it's not, okay, so if you have a Bible, open it up, Um, and if you have it on your phone, open up your app, and we are going to look at Luke chapter 6, starting at verse 27. Jesus says, to you who are listening to me, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the face, turn to them the other one as well. And if anyone takes your coat, don't withhold your shirt. Give to everyone who asks of you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, let them have it. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love only those who love you, what credit is that to you? Every, even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend only to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies? Do good to them? Lend to them without expecting anything back? Well, then your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. So be compassionate as your Father is compassionate. This is the word of the Lord. We give thanks to God for it. That's a mouthful, huh? Let's dig into the content of this just a little bit. We're simply going to apply the basic rules of good reading to this passage. And so this is why, Travis, we've got to teach kids English. All right? We've got to apply just the basic rules to good English. I do this frequently with students uh, because many students who haven't, especially if you haven't experienced Scripture much, treat Scripture like a book of spells Right? I just got to flip through and try to find the right spot for now. Right? And one of the ways we try to help students learn how to read the Bible um, is actually learning how to read the, the Bible in really practical ways. And so um, we're gonna, I'm just going to follow that same kind of rubric today. So let's start with where. This is actually really helpful for you note, note takers as well. So if you're a note taking person, um, you can follow along this way. Um, We're going to start with where Jesus at this point is in the Galilee region. That's northern Palestine. It's where Jesus grew up. It's home base for his ministry. It's where he spends most of his time in ministry and most of his life, quite frankly. So he's in very familiar space, which is why I feel real comfortable preaching about this here today. This feels like familiar space to me. Lots of familiar faces. In terms of when, it's near the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And most importantly, this is a time and the context um, in which Jesus, up to this point, We have not actually heard him teach. So this is a moment when we're going to actually hear the words of Jesus teaching for the very first time. We were told that he had taught and that it was really powerful and really significant, but the actual content of that teaching we had not yet heard in the Gospel of Luke. And so we're getting to that point when Luke is presenting to us the dissertation of Jesus on life and God and ministry And so it's a really significant moment in the ministry of Jesus up to this point as Luke presents it to us. And it's also really important to note the other thing about when is that Jesus up to this point in the Gospels has been embroiled in controversy, as I noted, 
when Jesus is um, from both what we today might uh, articulate as the right and the left are kind of both collaborating against Jesus and his ministry. Uh, And so the when of this moment is really significant. Now, of course, if we were doing some uh, kind of a series together, I would, I would note this more significantly, but the last thing I want to n- name about when is that uh, Jesus does th- says these words and does this almost immediately after coming down from the mountain. He had spent a whole night in prayer seeking God about all of these things and about raising up the leaders because we're going to get the apostles coming right out of this as well. And Jesus, in the midst of All of those things going on, the controversies and the challenges, before he steps up to teach this, he spends a whole night in prayer. And again, if we were doing a series on this, I would say, boy, it'd be nice to just park there and wonder. When things get difficult and challenging and there's tension growing, Jesus doubles down on prayer. And my impulse is to double down on strategic leadership meetings. There's, there's learning I need to do in this, right? But we're not going to go there today. We're just going to park that baby right there and move on into the rest of this text because there's enough to cover here. Anyway, Jesus comes down the mountain. He's with his ministry team of the apostles. There's all these other disciples surrounding him and a big, large crowd. It sounds like a very similar experience to the Sermon on the Mount, but this is Luke, and it's a sermon on the flat plain, so it sounds like Jesus sometimes preached the same sermon in different places. That gives me permission, which I'm really grateful for, uh, to do that. Anyway, he comes down the mountain, and in verse 27, he says to those gathered, you who are listening to me, that is the who in the passage, Jesus is speaking to all of those gathered around to hear his voice, which makes it a really natural application for us, doesn't it? To you, gathered here, listening to me, Jesus says, to to us also who want to hear what Jesus has to say about life and ministry and God. To you who are listening to me, Jesus says four things. Love your enemies, These are the verbs, Travis. Get this, buddy, okay? Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who mistreat you. The rest of uh, this section is just Jesus giving lots of practical examples about what this means. How do you love your enemies? How do you do good to those who hate you? How do you bless those who curse you? How do you pray for those who mistreat you? Well, it's kind of like this. If someone... Hit you, don't hit them back. If someone takes what belongs to you, eh, let them keep it. That all sounds really nice, pious talk, doesn't it? Come on, y'all, at least give me a nod. It sounds nice, like, oh, yeah, this is what we should do. Everybody should do this. This is good, right? Treat other people as you want to be treated. Great. It sounds really good until you start to dig into it a little bit and wonder. See, this is the problem with meditating on Scripture. It's, the Holy Spirit starts to make you wonder about things, and you start to wonder, if Jesus was here today, what practical examples would he give? Well, if someone rips you on social media, respond by telling them everything you appreciate about them. If someone at work took credit for what you did and got a promotion, offer them congratulations. If your neighbor keeps borrowing things from you and never gives them back, meh, let them keep it. Here's one that might get me thrown out. If you're walking around wearing a Make America Great hat, you should find a person wearing a Black Lives Matter shirt and love them as well as you possibly can. Oh, I just felt the room get a little hot. Because this is nuts. That's why. This is crazy talk. Who does this? Doesn't Jesus understand this is not how life works? No wonder people get so frustrated with Jesus. No wonder that what we would call the right and the left of ancient Israel are both conspiring against Jesus. This is nonsense. It's absurd. Doesn't he know? How absurd this is. Doesn't he know that if you give people an inch, they're going to take a mile? Doesn't he know that Democrats are all heart and no brains? 
Doesn't he know the Republicans don't care anything except the rich and nothing about the poor? Doesn't he get it? Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Come on, Jesus. I want this to be extra credit. You know what I'm talking about? Extra credit? Not core curriculum? I want my relationship with Jesus to be like core curriculum, you know? Like, God chose me before the foundations of the world. Give it to Yes. Keep it coming. Like, God loves me and adopted me in Christ. Yes, this is good. God is redeeming my life from the pit, establishing me in his kingdom. Oh, yeah. Come on. That's good. But all this other business about how I relate to other people, I want that to be extra credit. Do it if you want, but you know, you're not going to lose any credit if you don't. But in this passage, Jesus seems to say without qualification that you can gauge the quality of your relationship with the Father by how you relate to the people around you, particularly the people around you that you don't like. Like you can't live at peace with God and in hostility with your neighbor. Woof. But maybe, maybe Jesus is on to something here. I mean, it's no wonder he keeps getting himself into all kinds of trouble, right? You run around telling people, unless you love your enemies, you don't really love God either. You're bound to get in some trouble, especially in a politically charged, highly volatile climate of ancient Israel at the time of Jesus. I just want to say it's really good that we don't live in a politically charged, highly volatile climate, right? Because this would be really hard. But maybe Jesus does have something to say about the craziness that he's calling us to, about the radicalness of this idea. Because maybe Jesus isn't just talking about nice things that would be really great if you could put some of this into practice in your life. But maybe Jesus is here to not just teach us these things, but to show us these things. To embody good news about the peace of God to us. Because the one who says to us, friends, love your enemy, would be crucified in order to save his enemies. And the one who says to us, do good to those who hate you, would actually heal the severed ear of the man who came to arrest him. And the one who says to us, bless those who curse you, would himself be cursed so that we can be blessed. And the one who says to us to pray for those who mistreat you, would pray from the cross, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. See, Jesus doesn't just teach us here some nice ideas about God and about life. His actions demonstrate a radical orientation of life that is centered on the heart of the Father. And the heart of the Father, as he says to us in verse 36, is compassion. Be compassionate as your Father is compassionate. This is the why section for those of you that are note takers. Compassion may not be the translation that was in uh, your Bible, but I say to you it's a very good and appropriate translation of a uh, Greek word oiktirmon. I'm not going to ask you to repeat it. You don't have to pin it up here. Just know this about it. It is the exact same word that we find in the Greek Old Testament when the presence of God descends on Mount Sinai and God says to Moses in Exodus 34, gather the people around because I'm going to reveal myself. And God's self-revelation, that is God's proclamation to the world is this, I am the Lord. The compassionate and gracious God. God reveals himself to the world as the compassionate one. 
And so Jesus says to you who are listening to me, I say, be compassionate just as your father is compassionate. Show the world that you are children of God by behaving like God. That makes sense, right? All of us parents want our children to behave like us most of the time, right? For us who receive the gracious compassion of God through the life, death, resurrection, and current right now at this very moment intercession of Jesus Christ our Lord, compassion is to be our default setting. And so that raises, uh, back to the beginning, this really troubling question. If it is true that how, it is, how we are perceived as Christians in popular culture is having a reputation for being a bunch of angry hypocrites, and again, debatable, you, we can talk about that all you want, but if the perception has any truth to it at all, somehow we have missed the heart of our Father, who is compassionate even to the Wicked. And I think that, I think we get off the rails with this in large part because compassion is like a muscle that has to be exercised in order for it to get strong. All right, we're sliding into the how section, okay? We're not good at loving our enemies. We're not good at blessing those who curse us. The last time somebody cut you off in traffic, your response was probably not something like, hey, have a good day. There were probably less fingers waving. <laughs> right? For most of us, anger, that muscle's in tip-top shape. Right? Our current political climate stokes that anger, gets our loyalties from either the left or the right stoked in such a way that anger is even seen as a virtue. But compassion muscles... Those are kind of flimsy for a lot of us. We need to be able to, we need to exercise those. The reality of this came really clear to me a couple years ago when I was training for the Grand Rapids Marathon, which is happening this morning. I don't know if anybody's from here that was running that, but hopefully if you were, you're listening to this at some point, and hey, good job, you made it, I hope. Um, but I was a serious athlete as a teenager and then into college for a little while, but I had not trained in any meaningful way for well over a decade. Uh, but I took on the challenge uh, in order to raise money for clean water. I took on the challenge to go from couch to marathon um, over the course of about six months. And by grace, I, in a lot, of, lot, lot of training, uh, I was able to finish. It was not pretty. There are videos that live out there about it. Don't look for them. <laughs> It is an ugly thing. It just looks like a, a small man, a small blue thing kind of lurching toward the end. But here's what I learned in that process, that I had to exercise muscles that I didn't even remember <laughs> that exercised. It hurt. It was hard. There were many times where I, had, I did not want to get up early in the morning and run. But I did. And after a while, it started to become natural. And I got better at it. It was still hard work. Every, seriously, the first mile, every time, I just wanted to stop. Every day. But over time, I began to learn that I'm going to make it through that mile, and it's going to get better. And I started to experience the blessing of having all those muscles um, beginning to grow and develop in new ways. It was hard, but I trusted that it was going to be good. And I think compassion works like this in us. It is really hard. But if we trust that this is the heart of our Father, it's going to be good. Does that make sense? So I wonder what would happen if we were to set out to exercise and develop our compassion muscles. What if we were to start a trend in the West Michigan Christian community of radical compassion? What if we go out of our way to be generous to people we can't stand for a while? I mean, how awesome would it be if the reputation of Christians, at least in, in our area, started to be something to the effect of, those Christians are a little bit nuts, but they practice what they preach. I mean, what would it look like if, really practically speaking, this week you took one step, one step, right? you got to start a marathon somewhere. One step toward loving your enemies, doing good to someone who hates you, blessing someone who curses you or praying for someone who mistreats you. 
my hunch is you already know who that person is. They've been coming to your, been kind of flashing in your mind, and you've been pushing it back. Not that person, God. Not that person. No, not that person. Yeah, that, probably that person. One step toward exercising your Holy Spirit-empowered compassion muscles toward the end of becoming more like your Father, who is kind even to the wicked. I wonder what would happen to the reputation of Christ and to his church if we started to put one step of that into practice at a time. The uh, New Testament scholar Tom Wright uh, says about this very text, uh, he says this, this is beautiful. He says, the kingdom of, that Jesus preached and lived, that's the key, not just talking, but doing, preached and lived, was all about a glorious, uproarious, absurd generosity. Think of the best thing you can do for the worst person, do it. Think of what you really like someone to do for you, Go do that for somebody else. Think of the people to whom you are tempted to be nasty and lavish generosity on them instead. This is nuts, right? And this is who God is. And this is the person God is setting you free to become. It starts here, friends, with embracing this reality through the Spirit and through Christ. The Father has loved us. He has done good to us. He has blessed us. He, right now, at this present moment, intercedes for us. And when God looks at you, his heart is filled with compassion. And when the compassion of God sets us free, it awakens love, it awakens goodness, it awakens blessing, it awakens prayer. So this week, my encouragement, my challenge, my hope is that we take one step together toward becoming and embracing the compassionate people, the compassionate children who look just a little bit more like our Father. Amen? Let me pray for us. Lord, in Jesus Christ, you have in fact loved us. You have done good to us. You have blessed us. You even now today intercede for us that we might become more like Jesus, that we might know you more. Your spirit testifies to our spirit, says the scripture, that we are children of God and heirs to your kingdom. And so, God, awaken that in us, that more tomorrow than even today, we might be oriented radically around your heart, God, your heart of compassion demonstrated to us in Jesus Christ. May it be demonstrated through us by the working of your Holy Spirit, and all the places and spaces you call us to live. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.